Good. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Sofal. I'm a senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about this fancy thingy called OCI artifacts and how to install this other fancy thingy in it, AI ML models or other types of artifacts. Um, before I kick things off, I would like to assess the audience, assess you a bit, um, so we kind of know uh, where we are and what we're going to be talking about, if it's important to you or if it's not, uh, if it changes your life or if it doesn't and you're just for the show, uh, you're here just for the show. Let's see. Um, so, easy. Um, are you using any AI product tool? Have you used any of those things? Cool. It's fairly obvious. Uh, have you played around with any AI model directly? So, moved all those um, bars and, and tuned things. Cool. Have you fine tuned a model? Okay, last hands. And have you trained a model from scratch? Cool, great. About 10 people. So, raise your left hand if you're a data scientist or AI developer. Okay. And raise your right hand if you're a software engineer ops. Uh, sorry. Okay, look around. People with left hand raised should talk to people with right hand raised. <laughs> talk to each other. Um, and last question Have you ever deployed a model to production? One, two. That's part of the question. Uh, you see, two people. Uh, how was it? Uh, it was really nice. Yeah. Really nice? Uh, how was the experience of deploying a model? I feel like at first I had to like write a lot of like um, CD code that took so long, but like once I finished that, yeah. it was like a breeze. Writing your own CI CD and a lot of additional work. Yeah, but then it was fun. Okay, cool. Um, that's hinting a very good point that I would like to talk about today. Um, so, what I want to talk about now is uh, the storage options for AI models that we use today that are uh, common in the industry, uh, why they are wrong, uh, and how we can do better. Um, for example, by introducing uh, OCI artifacts or um, these things into, into, into this space. Um, Hinting a bit of optimization techniques uh, that might help, and some tool recommendations. Things that I will not, not do today, I will not solve the problems for you. I will not dictate you a solution that fits all the sizes, that is always right, and um, that thing is still up to you to decide. This talk should give you more information to make educated uh, decisions. So. It's not a sales pitch. It's not a. Um, it's. I'm not trying to enforce any technology on you. So why should you care about uh, how a model is stored, uh, or if there are if we are using the tool that is right to store a model? Um, first statement I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make here is the model storage tools used today are not ideal. They were designed to accommodate data scientists and AI, develop, AI developers uh, UX and their use case, their, their comfort. But now we are trying to retrofit it into software development lifecycle. We are trying to bridge feature gaps uh, that in tools, in ecosystems, where all of this is just an afterthought. It's, and we're doing it through hacks, we are introducing additional unnecessary complexity. And we don't need to do that. 
all we have to do instead of reinventing new things, we can just repurpose, reuse what we have. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate that through OCR artifacts. It can be a different tool if you are using a different system, ecosystem. So what we have right now available, um, readily and commonly used within the model storage ecosystem nowadays. These are three representatives. It's not an exhaustive list. It's not all of the options out there. There's a ton of them. I think they sum up uh, the most common options out there uh, pretty well. Um, whoever used S3 to store models? OK. Who's using Hugging Face? Good. And who have used Olama? OK. So I kind of found the right tools. Um, I'm going to argue that none of these is the right tools for the job. Uh, that doesn't mean there is not a use case for them or uh, that they can't work for this particular use case in certain circumstances. They are all designed with uh, UX in mind, with um, accessibility, with um, enabling you to very quickly, very easily um, upload something uh, into that storage network, whatever it is, uh, and, or download it from there. Um, so for S3, as a data storage backend, as an object storage, it's very easy. That's what it was designed for. You just put a payload there. You just upload it there. It lives there. Whenever you need it, you just query for it, download it. Um, the same with Hugging Face, which is using a kind of a bit different approach. Uh, instead of being an object storage, it's tracking things in Git repositories with Git large file system as a backend for the models. And you're basically using this Python SDK to push your train model there, right? No fancy stuff going on. A single command, I have my model uploaded. Or a single command, I have my model downloaded. I don't care about what's behind the scenes. Similar thing with Olama, uh, sort of like a Docker-like experience. Um, I can just very simply push a model uh, to a centralized hub, and I'm done with it. My, my job is published. The thing gets a bit more complicated on the other side of the fence, when I want to serve it, when I want to uh, launch it, when I want to deploy it. Um, as you can see for Hugging Face or Olama, this is fairly straightforward. Again, just a few simple commands here and there uh, that satisfy the needs of deploying something as a playground, as a local deployment. Um, for fun, for my local fr friends, or um, you know, a dev environment, maybe somewhere in, in public cloud, whatever. Uh, when it comes to S3, this was not designed as a data science tool, so this is a bit more complicated, and you need to use additional tooling accompanied uh, or together with, with my S3 stored model. Um, so for example, in this, in this case, I'm going to opt in for using KSERF. Uh, as my like Kubernetes uh, inference service. That can natively interface with S3 because that's the legacy, um, the legacy model storage backend that we can use. As you may have noticed, this is very much targeting the playground experience, the local deployment experience, except the case server. If we want to deploy things like adults uh, into production, into a um, industry leading um, ecosystems that can help us um, do additional ops on top of it, we the current platform of choice is Kubernetes. I there may be others, definitely, but most of us will use Kubernetes to deploy models or serve models in production. And that's when it, gets, when it gets complicated. We end up with a bunch of tools, bunch of exploding, very exploding ecosystem of tools that are here to facilitate things for us on various levels of complexity or ease of use or um, 
some things are vendor specific, some are open source, and really making sense of this uh, is, is hard. Um, and where this complexity comes from? It comes from the problem that the model serving or the model storage is not designed to support this type of use case. We are filling the gaps, filling the feature gaps, retrofitting technology to uh, be able to communicate with Kubernetes, to be able to run on top of Kubernetes, um, or be properly containerized or whatever. So if we take a bit of an overview of these three um, technologies I've picked, um, from, this, from the point of view of an engineer, from the point of an ops SRE person, um, yeah, still easy to push and pull, that's still there. That's all green. But when it comes to the additional things that I'm looking for as a software engineer, I find them missing. I find them lacking. Um, with Olama, all my, all my models need to be of a specific Olama format. When I take a hugging face, image, a hugging face model, import it in Olama, it gets converted to Olama format. Uh, when I want to do version control on S3, I can't, I need to come up with additional solutions uh, and create additional overhead. Um, and if I'm an enterprise and I want my models to be privately hosted, self-hosted, I really don't have much of uh, other options than S3. Because Hugging Face, they have a private instance, but it's on cloud. It's, it's, running somewhere in the internet, it won't be on my own infrastructure. And if I want that, I'm screwed. Um, the same with Ulama. Ulama has only this public index, nothing else. So what can I do? I'm screwed. Um, or I need to come up with additional tools, additional complexity, design things on top of all of this. So, and the same goes to the case I made previously about the prograde serving. So what can we do about this? Before we try to come up with a solution, I would like to know what an AI model is, technically. Um, whatever format I choose for AI model, it's basically these three things. A little bit, bit of metadata, architecture of the model can be, doesn't have to be present because I can be reusing a well-known architecture. So that's already maybe part of my SDK. So it's just a pointer there. It doesn't need to be a full architecture, but it can. But the most of the weight, uh, most of the content of an AI model is this checkpoints, weights, the individual tensor weights. It's huge. So like if I put these boxes, these rectangles to scale, this metadata and architecture wouldn't be even visible there. Um, that's what's causing the biggest problem. So if that is my AI model, which category does it fit? Is it data? Can I read it? Can I listen to it? Can I open it, see what's inside? Can I make some sense of it? Can I use it as regular data, as for example, the data set it's been trained on? I don't think so. Um, remember, S3 is designed as data storage. Um, I don't think that's the best option to choose. So let's put a nice red cross there. Is it source code? Um, Hugging Face thinks it's source code because they are putting it into Git repo. I don't think so. I don't think you can review a model the way you review source code. Um, you, probably, you probably can, but who would argue about reverting a change in AI model as you would with Comet on source code? Um, can I audit it? Can I compile it after I have my AI model? Can I build it? Is it really source code? I don't think so. So is it an application or a library? Is it a binary I can just run? Um, or is, can I use it as a dependency, as a library sort of things? Um, can it be used as is? 
Well, I don't think so either, but it's the closest of these three categories. Um, it certainly is a binary. Uh, I can't use it as a standalone thing, so maybe I can use it as a as a dependency. Well, maybe maybe Olama is up to something. Uh, maybe they are doing some things right. So, what do we really need here? What do we really need to understand and see here? Um, we've already approached this from the left side of this slide. Uh, as an AI developer, I need something that works well with my Jupyter notebooks. It allows me for easy collaboration. It allows me for model evaluation. Allows me to track experiments, whatever. Um, all of this is part of the AI ML developer UX. But now, since models are reaching production, I need to bring in software development lifecycle best practices into it as well. I, I need things to be immutable versioned. I need to be able to do CI CD. I need, able to, I need to be able to do audits, uh, checks, security compliance, attestations, uh, whatever you can think of as software development lifecycle uh, inventions that we made over the last 20, 30 years. Um, you may have noticed that we are kind of reinventing those for AI space yet again. Um, should we do it? I would say no. So instead of taking a tool for data science and making it a tool for operations, I think we should go the other way around. We should take a tool for operations, designed with operations in mind, and just provide better UX so it's on the same level of usability as the tools for data scientists. So let's think of model storage as a registry. It needs to be accessible. It needs to be consumable. It needs to provide all these software development lifecycle advantages. And it needs to be a first level citizen in the platform of our choice for production. It needs to be able to work together with our um, with the compliance procedures we have in place. Uh, we need it to work together well. And it also needs to be very well scalable because AI models can be very different. You can have an AI model that is just tens of megabytes big and it does well on an assembly line and we still call it AI model. And you can have ChatGPT4, which is, I don't know, 700 gigabytes more or less. Um, I need a way how we, I can store all of this. Maybe there's not one size that, one, one shoe that fit all sizes, but maybe we can try to aim for that. Um, solution I choose for this is OCI Artifacts. Um, it's the, whoever worked with OCI Artifacts here? Good portion of the audience. Good, good. So, you know, it's just a younger sibling to um, OCI Container Images. It uses the same infrastructure, um, same formats, slight tweaks here and there, but what it actually does from an end user point of view, it turns magical OCI container registries, um, complex thingy into a very accessible, approachable, content agnostic object storage with all the additional uh, software development lifecycle um, goodies on top of it. So, kind of as free on steroids, that is DevSecOps friendly. And I think that's what we need here. I'm not the first person to argue this, to uh, say this might be a thing. There was a very nice talk at KubeCon Europe um, this year from Bloomberg, who are using OCR artifacts as their uh, model backend, model storage backend uh, already in, in their infrastructure. Um, there's also a Python SDK tool that uh, 
Matteo Mortari, colleague of mine, is developing, um, and it aims to bring in it aims to bring in uh, the same level of uh, ease of access. So if I'm going to extend this list with OCI artifacts, it checks most of the boxes, except maybe we will take a bit of more, a bit closer look on the easy to pull and push because it's new to us. And let's think a bit about the product grade serving, if it's already there or not. So how can I download a model or upload a model with OCI artifacts? We have this tool called ORAS, which is uh, the interface, the CLI for OCI artifacts. And it's, it's as simple as this, a single command. Again, the UX is very simple. If I want something more data science-y with some additional quirks and uh, buttons, and knobs that I can tune, we have this tool called OMLDM. Uh, it does basically the same. It just allows you to construct more complicated, uh, complicated artifacts. And it's designed for, uh, for AI use case. So when it comes to serving the model, I can do the same as I did with S3. I need an extra adapter for KServe because it's not part of the tree of, for KServe now, but I can do it. I, instead of S3 protocol referencing in the storage URI, I will reference an OCI URI. Done. Or if I want to be very fancy and do things on my own without KServe, since Tuesday there's this new Kubernetes release and there's new alpha feature to it, uh, so very fresh. Um, in the QR code, there's a link to a blog uh, about this change. Um, very, very good read. Um, that allows you to directly mount uh, OCI artifacts as volumes to your pods. So I can get my data directly accessible, pulled from uh, Docker Hub, Quay, um, whatever GitHub uh, container registry storage I have, directly accessible. So, what benefits does this bring to me? I'm using the same life cycle as for my container images. So very much easier for my ops, sorry folks. Uh, same management and governance. Same distribution channels. Shared caching. I think this is a very uh, omitted, uh, omitted advantage. Uh, remember how, or if you know how things are done today, people are pulling hugging face models into a persistent volume and cache, cache it there. What if, what if I want to take the same model and run it in five different namespaces? I'm just downloading it five times and caching it five times. I don't have to do this with OCI. So how does the OCI artifact look on the inside? Um, it's just a bunch of files and metadata to it. Nothing fancy. With OCI, everything starts with a manifest, which is a simple JSON, and there's basically two things that are interesting to us to, here. One is an array called layers, which in case of OCI artifacts, is just a pointer to files, list of files, list of blobs, um, which each has a name, each has a hash and file type. That's about it. And annotations, which contain some metadata to it. That's what is interesting to us. There's also subject, which allows us to link and attach different OCI artifacts together, creating a hierarchy, chaining things. So this is how our AI model looked before. We're just wrapping it into OCI artifact. We're not doing anything else to it. It's very simple. So this is just the beginning of a journey. Um, I've just took the same single huge binary blob and wrapped it in something else and uploaded it somewhere else. Is anything clever about it? I don't know. I don't think it, it is all the way there. I think we can go further. So I would encourage you to all think about your AI models, how you are storing them, because dumping a single blob is easy, but is it the best thing to do? I don't think so. For example, just a few hints here. Um, we can do things like model sharding. 
it can make sense here and there. So instead of me creating a many gigabytes single blob, I'm gonna save each tensor weights into a separate file. What does this do? So instead of a structure like this, I can end up with a structure like this. Is it helpful by itself? Well, there are a few arguments you can make how this is helpful. It can lower uh, or improve your network transfer reliability because if I download a seven, 700 gigabytes file and after I download it, I find out the checksum doesn't match, what will I do? Um, I need to re-download it. Um, with this, I have at least smaller chunks. Uh, or I can parallelize the download. Um, I can download multiple tensor weights at the same time. And I think the huge benefit here is if, I'm, if my model is suitable in its use case for uh, freezing layers when fine-tuning, this is the best thing you can do. Because instead of a model like this, instead of a model like this, or OCI artifact, you end up with artifact like this. Tensor 0 to 24 is just a pointer to existing object. object. If I'm pushing this to an inference endpoint, all it needs to download is those five last new tensors. It doesn't need to download the whole bunch. Just a few bits and bobs here. So, as next step, I would like to encourage you to watch the KubeCon talk, watch Matteo's demo on uh, OCI artifacts for uh, ML model metadata um, storing. And if you want to know about more tools available there, I encourage you to check out uh, the uh, Matteo's tool in the container space and ORAS. Uh, with that, thank you very much for listening to me, and if you have any questions, now's the time. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, I, uh, I, I worked a little bit on the um, OCI volume mount, so I'm excited that you're excited about that. Um, I find myself wondering, um, with the sharding um, uh, example that you had, how common is it when you update a model that only individual uh, pieces of that shard will actually be updated? Because I, I don't have a great concept of what a model actually looks like structurally, but it would kind of be my understanding that like a lot of it would end up changing as you update it. And like, so does the sharding, you know, actually correlate with the amount, like does an updated blob in that, uh, you know, sharded, is it that, uh, related to the amount that you updated the model, or is it often that you'll update like large chunks of those shards? Um, depends. Um, you can make sharding by size. So you just basically say, I want my file size to be limited to X amount of gigabytes. In that case, it's not really helpful because it's not breaking things on the logical um, separation points. Um, but you can also set, like, I want the size to be as low as possible, which is the trick I've I see. used here with the zero, uh, which basically says store individual tensors as a separate file. In that case, I have each uh, network layer as a separate uh, weights file, basically. And there are use cases where this makes sense. Imagine I have uh, networks which are using subnetworks, and I'm retraining only part of the model. Um, or I'm doing um, image classification. I don't need to retrain layers which are there to uh, do edge detection. Um, I may be just retraining the higher level levels, the topmost five levels maybe. Um, so in those cases, this makes a great sense because the rest of the model stays the same, and I don't need to download it again. I don't need to distribute it again. 
Cool, thank you. And, and at the granularity of a tensor, um, how many files get created typically with, you know, imagine like a 50 gig model or something like that. Do you have any idea how many would be created? Like, do you think that the like inode overhead would be oh, like large yeah, enough to like be sort of, you know? Usually what I saw is in lower hundreds. Okay, cool, thank you. So the uh, Podman team's working on basically a tooling to do similar to what Aris is doing at this point. Um, the big difference is that Podman will follow the rules of mirroring and, um, and make it easier for things like Trio to be able to use it. Um, so bottom line is I'd like you to work closely with them to make sure that the stuff you're talking about is going to work with the, the new tooling that they're putting in. Um, to make this all work together, so. Yep, thank you. So I think I was at one of the earlier AI talks, um, probably I think Tuesday, where it was talking about fine tuning approaches to AI models and one of them, it sounded like you would start with that your base LLM and then you would just be effectively adding another smaller, finer tune model on top of it, which in some ways that's what Instruct Lab does, in, at least that's my mental model of kind of what Instruct Lab is doing. Uh, so I'm wondering if we're using OCI, if we want to serve, say, like an Instruct Lab model that is like base granite plus this other thing that we trained, um, would that be very useful where if we want to serve this all together, you have you know, one layer that's the granite layer and then the next layer is the instruct lab on top. Can be. Um not sure that this instruct lab scenario totally fits this picture. Um but there can be scenarios like I'm doing uh LoRa fine tuning and I'm creating a difference matrix for weights instead of like um, retraining my weights I will produce uh, another matrix which is basically just a difference to my previous weights to my base model in that case I can just I don't need to even like modify my model I can just link to the previous version of it and say this is a difference ma matrix that I can apply on top that I can overlay and now we are very much moving towards rather OCI artifacts rather than OCI artifacts we're moving more towards container images themselves because their layers that's also an overlay an incremental overlay so um, there's definitely other steps other options uh, that other paths we can take here uh, that will be much more beneficial for your use case, for example. Uh, but what I think is important uh, is to converge on the storage space uh, that we are using the same tools as our regular app developers are using. I'm not sure I have a question, but this just this starts to paint the picture of the idea where we have these huge base models that are, um, you know, the frontier models, but then we all can have thousands or millions of small domain specific uh, uses or smaller models that are layered on top of those. So you could have you know, your one huge frontier model in, in a Kubernetes cluster, but then the, you could, each namespace could be like a different agent or tools you know, trained for something specific. And that's how I see this kind of rolling out. Yes, um, that's... That is not a question. That's, that's looking into future. Um, that definitely can be the future. Uh, what I was talking about now is what's available now, what you can use right now, right away. And I think it's a path towards that future. Uh, it's, I'm not talking about the ultimate solution here. I'm just saying this is the path we should embark on. Uh, what kind of hardware? Yeah, what what, what kind of um, 
Yeah, what kind of hardware do you use to uh, test the uh, to test your models? Um, yeah. So, I am not producing new models with this. It's just repackaging the existing modules. So all you basically need is uh, be a have enough storage capacity to download a model. Uh, that's that's about it. Um, we're out of time. Sorry for that. Uh, I can ask some more questions. Thank you.